Sup y'all, and welcome to the Geography of Industry and Services, Part 1. In this video, we're going to start our investigation of economic geography by looking at the origin of the Industrial Revolution and asking this essential question, how did the Industrial Revolution begin and then diffuse globally? Now, economic geography attempts to explain the locational pattern of an economic activity in terms of the factors that influence the distribution of wealth across an area. So, to begin, we live in a globalized world that could not have possibly existed even half a century ago. Today, more than 60% of all seaborne trade, the most common means of trade, is carried through container ships. The concept of these mammoth vessels only originated in the middle of the 20th century. However, they have grown substantially. The quantity of goods carried by container ships has gone from around 100 million metric tons in 1980 to over 1.6 billion metric tons today. The global expansion of production and trade has been nothing short of remarkable. But when did this era of globalization actually begin? Major civilizations and empires dominated vast stretches of territory in the past. The Egyptians, the Mayans, the Han Chinese, the Romans, and so on. But these empires were regional in their political reach, dominant in their respective areas for certain, but not truly global in scale. The first great empire in human history to truly be called global was... Portugal. By the middle of the 16th century, during the Age of Discovery, the Portuguese Empire had holdings and colonies in Europe, South America, Africa, and Asia. This age ushered in an era of globalized production and trade that has increased over the years, and, as stated earlier, has only accelerated. Obviously, we didn't just jump from sailing on caravels and galleons centuries ago to the enormous container ships used currently, so let's fill in some of the blanks. In many ways, the term industrial revolution is a misnomer, since industries and manufacturing existed since the first agricultural villages began forming over 10,000 years ago. For instance, in the so-called pre-industrial world, cottage industries existed. Merchants and entrepreneurs would sometimes work out deals with peasant families who would operate a simple business or manufacture goods, such as textiles, from their homes. This work was usually done during the winter months, when the peasants had little else to do, and utilizing cheap labor, the merchants could make greater profits. The desire to find cheaper means of production and cheaper labor has always been a supreme motivating factor, and has led us to the global division of labor of our modern world. The merchants of the past, like the business leaders of today, seek to improve on the economies of scale, in which increasing the production of a good reduces the average cost of producing that good per unit. So we bring our story back to the beginning stages of the first Industrial Revolution, which spanned from around 1750 to around 1870. And what made this time period so revolutionary was the replacement of human labor with machines, often powered initially through the use of animals. This revolution had its hearth in Britain, and why it began there has everything to do with geography. Looking at the five themes of geography, we can see some of the reasons why Britain was in the right place, at the right time, with the right resources, and the right conditions. Starting with location, Europe at the time was the core region of the world, with more money and technology than anywhere else. Britain's favorable relative location was a huge advantage. And as they improved, so did the region around them. As far as human environmental interaction, the colder temperatures that affected the globe due to the Little Ice Age had pushed Europe into the second agricultural revolution, in which many machines were devised to replace human and animal labor. This started the process of mechanization that would be taken to a greater scale through the first industrial revolution. For place, Britain possessed many valuable natural resources, such as many fast-flowing rivers, which would be extremely valuable for the early factories that were powered through water wheels. And then, with the improvement of steam power in the late 18th century, Britain possessed other materials, from a variety of metals to energy resources like coal. This brings us to the first major factor of production, land. Now, it's not the amount of land that's important. In fact, Britain's relatively smaller land area and compact territorial morphology meant it was cheaper to transport materials from place to place. 
In this instance, it's what's in the land that is important. To be exact, industrialization began in places like the Midlands of north-central England, with close proximity to resources and ports which facilitated trade. Looking at region, due to the enclosure movement, many peasants were unable to afford to keep their lands, and they migrated from the rural regions to the urban ones, in the cities, because that's where jobs could be found. With this massive influx of cheap labor, Britain had the means necessary to run their factories with far less cost. This brings us to the second major factor of production, labor, and especially for the beginning stages of the Industrial Revolution, abundant cheap labor was of paramount importance. And the last theme is movement. Due to Britain's many colonies, there was a cheap influx of raw materials acquired from afar through their merchant marine, and in turn, a plethora of markets they could sell their goods to, all the while protecting their trade routes with the best navy in the world. Britain had a government that was eager to pass pro-business laws and tariffs to support their mercantilist policies. For instance, supporting the British East India Company, considered the world's first multinational corporation, established in the year 1600. This quasi-governmental company maintained its own army, navy, and exclusive trading rights throughout many parts of the world until its dissolution in the 1870s. So now, Britain also possessed the third major factor of production, capital which refers to the goods and revenue used for production. The collective effects of land, labor, and capital enabled Britain to be the first to enter into the Industrial Revolution. The first industry to truly mechanize was the textile or cloth industry. This makes perfect sense in that through the second agricultural revolution, more food and natural fibers were produced than ever before. There were major increases in the production of flax used for making linen, as well as wool and cotton. With such an overabundance of raw materials, the need to process them into thread and finished textiles was a logical progression. As stated earlier, locational criteria for industrializing include considerations such as proximity to energy sources and raw materials. Since the earliest factories were powered through water wheels, they had to be adjacent to rivers. However, this changed with improvements in technology. The steam engine enabled manufacturers greater choice in where they could locate their factories. It affected production, transportation, and communication. The steam engine had a plethora of uses, such as pumping water from coal mines, as well as powering steamships and locomotives. As you can see in this chart, the impact of distance decay was reduced as tracks were laid down, and as the speeds of trains increased. For instance, travel from London to Manchester in the horse and buggy era of 1750 would take upwards of three days' travel, whereas a century later, that time was reduced to around six hours. This is what time-space compression is all about. The world feels as if it gets smaller as transport and communication technology improves. And certainly the Industrial Revolution diffused first to relatively close places such as the Netherlands, Germany, France, Poland, Italy, and Russia and across the Atlantic to the United States. Wherever industrialization took root, it had a spillover effect on other areas connected by way of transport nodes, along ports, rivers, canals, and rail lines, such as to the Ruhr Valley found in Germany, the most industrially productive region in Europe today. No matter how you look at it, the Industrial Revolution changed the world forever.